thinking about the story. Um, it, look, it seems that like uh, Humpty Dumpty was a cannon uh, and was used in, in a, um, a British revolt uh, around 1840s, something like that. Um, and um, uh, somehow Humpty got knocked off the wall. <laughs> he was up on a wall, got knocked off the wall. And so that uh, seems to be the origin of the story. Uh, nobody could get him back up on the wall. So um, uh, the story has evolved and to where instead of being a cannon, Humpty is an egg, an egg, an egg, uh, which is, um, uh, adds a lot of interest to the story. Um, Um, one version or one comment on this story is that um, it's a story of risk, of failure, and of perseverance. Um, three qualities that characterize Zen practice. It's a great Zen story. Um, uh, um, you know, when we uh, sit zazen, we take a risk, especially when we're, when we're new to zazen, new to the practice. Sitting, I remember when I first started sitting, uh, sitting one period of zazen <coughs> was a um, uh, very significant experience. <coughs> um, I w um, uh, and it was really hard to get through one period of zazen without moving. Um, I remember when I went to my first, I, I think I told you this story recently, when I went to uh, zazen for this first or second time, uh, and I said, um, to my neighbor, I said, this really hurts. And he said, it always does. <laughs> um, and I thought, should I, well, should I, do, I like doing it. There's something that drove me to do this. I don't know, it was just, I had to do it. And so I just continued because, well, since everybody's, uh, uh, everybody's legs hurt. Why should I be the exception? So uh, I continued. And uh, I looked forward to sitting. But then when I got there, I realized, oh, this is going to hurt. This is going to be painful. But at the same time, um, I was taking a, a chance, so to speak. I was putting myself in a position that was felt risky, actually. The whole thing felt risky, you know, like this foreign practice, Japanese practice, um, the priests were all wearing robes. There were only two, actually, Suzuki Roshi and Katagiri Roshi wearing robes. And, um, sitting very still. But what I really liked about it was that I was sitting, um, I, w I felt that I was, I was alone, and at the same time, I felt totally supported. Um, I brought a friend to, uh, um, who was actually a very famous musician now. I won't tell you what, what his name is. Um, 
we went together the first time to Zazen, or the second time. I brought him to Zazen early. And uh, he had to crawl out of the Zendo because his, his legs hurt so much. Um, so that's the kind of, you know, I, w I would have wished that he would have come back, but he didn't. And it was a kind of failure on his part. And so I didn't feel so good about that, and he didn't feel so good about that. But um, uh, failure is a part, big part of our, uh, of our life, our life's practice. Um, it's important to fail because it really helps us um, to understand that um, things are not one-sided. Success and failure are um, both important. And our failure helps us in our, to, to work for our success. If it's only failure, um, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, you know, we um, really appreciate the person who has a difficult time uh, in uh, their practice or in their life. But when we see that they're making a big effort, the effort is the most important thing, not necessarily the success. Effort itself is successful because each step of the way is our practice. There's no, we say, you know, don't put another head on top of your own or don't work for um, some kind of um, gaining experience. Um, it's, uh, to gain something is fine, but to work for some kind of um, uh, exceptional experience is not so good because then you, uh, your uh, effort becomes oriented toward a goal um, that may or may not be achieved, but um, it's somewhere in the distant, in the, in the, in the distant future. Um, It's us in practice, or our practice, uh, is uh, to appreciate every step of the way. So if we can appreciate this moment's step, you've already reached the goal. If you can, uh, so we go from now, our, our, our practice goes from now to now. It doesn't go from now to then or someplace in the future. It goes from now, from now to now. So we just simply experience every moment as it occurs. And that's our success, to be able to do that. <clears throat> so how we exist in this moment, and this moment, <laughs> this moment was nothing but this moment. Nothing but a succession of this moment. That's hard to do. The, the, mo the most difficult thing is to be here. It's easy to be in the future because that's in your head. <laughs> but it's really hard to just be here with this, with, with this, whatever is, is going on. That's called living our life, moment by moment, which is simply this moment. You think that there are successive moments going from past to future, but it's all just this moment. That's all there is. <clears throat> that's, uh, and that's what Zazen teaches us. Zazen teaches us to just be present, because there's nothing but this moment. There's the past, which is 
um, this moment in our head, in our mind, and there's the future to which we're making up uh, as if um, there was one. <laughs> you know, where does the where does where does the past and the future meet? Where is that where is that place where the past and the future meet? It's called the present, right? The past and the future meet in the present. But where is the line? Can't, it's really hard to find the line where um, past, present, and future meet because it's already gone. So the only thing that doesn't um, uh, 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 change is the present. So there's the ephemeral present, which we think of as now, and there's the eternal present, which is nothing but present, 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 present. <clears throat> so what we appreciate in a Zen student is perseverance. You fall down, we're all, we're all Humpty Dumpty, and, and the egg is important. If, if Humpty Dumpty was still just a cannon, it wouldn't be so interesting. But because it's an egg, it is interesting. Because the egg holds its future within itself. So, uh, you know, Um, the egg contains, we, we all have an egg here. <laughs> this is our egg, and we're nurturing our egg all the time, just like a chicken, you know, <laughs> uh, or a vulture, or um, Peregrine, pilgrim. So perseverance, you know, um, taking a risk, falling down, and uh, getting back up. Dogen has this uh, phrase. Uh, when you fall to the ground, you use the ground to help you get back up. That's wonderful. Because instead of being used, we're using. When we make a mistake, when we um, have a big problem, we, and uh, it turns into a big problem. We use the mistake to help us. That's why making mistakes are really uh, healthy. Well, for one thing, if we don't uh, make excuses <laughs> and justify ourselves, uh, um, uh, and humble ourselves, uh, the mistake becomes a treasure because we learn from it. We learn from our mistakes. And if we can't learn from our mistakes, we're in trouble. So mistake is valuable. Failure, you know, failure, um, gives us a sense of perspective and helps us to find our direction. Uh, the sixth ancestor, Daikon Eno, in his platform, in the Platform Sutra, <coughs> uh, says when you uh, make a mistake, you do a little repentance, whatever is necessary, um, acknowledgement, basically, 
uh, and then you turn around and go the other way, in the right direction. Turn around and go in the right direction. It may not be a total turnaround, it can be half turnaround, maybe all of it's needed. It's like um, the four horses um, from a, a sutra, I, which I can't remember the name of. Suzuki Roshi liked to use this. Of the four horses, um, and most of you probably know it already, um, uh, when the, when the, uh, the driver uh, um, uh, wants the horses to move, he uses the whip. <clears throat> uh, the best horse, or the most, you know, um, I don't see what best, um, the quickest horse, or the horse that's more, the most mature horse, um, what just seeing that, just seeing the driver with a whip will, um, out of the corner of its eye, will move without being um, uh, cajoled. The second horse, seeing the, uh, feel, just feeling the whip on its uh, skin will move. The third horse, when the, the whip digs into its hide, will move. The fourth horse <laughs> um, really struggles. Stubborn, uh, stupid, whatever. And uh, Suzuki Roshi said, so which horse do you think is the best horse? Or the horse that, uh, he says, when Buddha sees the fourth horse, that's the horse that he loves. The most difficult. So, um, uh, And it's the hardest one to love, <laughs> often. Um, so risk, failure, and perseverance. Right now, um, we have this uh, interesting um, uh, change in our lives. This pandemic has just changed our lives. You know, some people's lives have been changed dramatically. And some people's lives, maybe not so much. Um, you know, if you if um, you've been practicing Zen, Zazen, once or twice a day for a long time, Sun Sistines, so forth, um, done Zen no practice, your life doesn't hasn't doesn't change that much because already you're living in a kind of simplicity and confinement, you know, to sit seven days uh, at seven days of sheen is um, uh, a, a lot of confinement. You're sitting in a posture that's the most confined posture. And you're doing the practice which is uh, confined to, the, to a room. So you're kind of used to this. Um, I've uh, run into many people, Zen students, who have said, what a great relief <laughs> to, you know, be able to just do this simple practice uh, called pandemic. It's not a big change for so many people and, and we actually make use of it. So I think 
to be able to make use of it, to be in a position where you can make use of it, uh, is how we practice with it. Um, as I said in a few lectures back, that um, uh, we have an opportunity to look at what what our space, our our our, um, our environment, the environment that we live in and uh, um, relax into it and look at what, ne what we've neglected for so long, all the things that we overlook um, and uh, take care of things in a way that, you know, we wouldn't otherwise. We become so used to our routines that um, uh, we tend to walk past things, you know, without really paying attention to them. And somehow, when you have the opportunity to not do all those, as many things as we ordinarily do, we begin to see what's really around us. When we take a walk, Berkeley is so great for taking walks. I mean, the, the trees and the bushes and the flowers, and, which we just often just bypass. That's the background, right? And we allow it to be, come into the foreground. We allow all the stuff that we, you, we think of as the stage set for our lives <laughs> becomes a real part of our lives. And we see that these... Uh, wonderful gardens and uh, wonderful um, uh, living beings that we're surrounded with, um, they come to the forefront. I'm, I'm just amazed, you know, after it rains, when we have the first rain after, after the summer, all, all this life is... Um, uh, shiny in our, in our face and supporting our life. You know, uh, my wife and I were talking about um, uh, sourdough starter <laughs> and how you preserve sourdough starter without having to put it in the refrigerator and <laughs> just dry it out. And it, it's just this dry stuff, you know. It's, it's like sand or something. And yet it's alive, totally alive. You put it back in the water and it comes back to life, so to speak. But it's never been dead. So there's all this life around us that's continually supporting us. And we're always thinking about thinking other things, which is okay. We, we, you know, we have a variety of interests. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is our support. When we allow our surroundings to be our support, this is the um, uh, king's men and the king's horses that actually support us. Although all the king's men, horses and all the king's men, couldn't put, hum, put Humdi together again, but they do support us. When we, when we allow that to happen, we're supported by all of our surroundings. Um, then there's the egg. The egg is our legacy. The egg, egg, the, you know, most, uh, all actually, not most, all of the animal kingdom, without exception, the goal of the, all the animals is to reproduce itself. And 
and it's the same with humans, except that we have other, all these other things <laughs> because we have a, a, a um, certain level of consciousness which creates um, a curiosity uh, and, and our, our brain is highly developed in comparison to the brains of other species. Anyway, we think that's true. It's hard to know if that's true or not, whether the species with the smallest brains are maybe the most advanced. <laughs> they don't need to go through all this stuff that we have to go through. Their life is very simple. You know, the American Indians, uh, the Native Americans, and, and, and their uh, 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 um, advanced societies realized all this. Um, and every animal had, had a place in the hierarchy, or in the, uh, not hierarchy, but in this hierarchy, uh, pantheon, if you want to call it that. Every um, uh, every animal, every bug, every living thing, because the whole, the, all of their surroundings was, was uh, teeming with life. They understood this and were supported by, they supported the ground and were supported by the ground. And when they would fall to the ground, the ground would help them back up. Um, I've always felt that um, if we persevere, if we really make a big effort, um, uh, uh, that uh, life meets us halfway, Buddha meets us halfway. That's why people pray. Um, uh, one good reason why people pray, so that, you know, to meet life halfway, the source. And then the source responds. So what we appreciate in a Zen student is perseverance. And uh, we don't take uh, umbrage when people um, fail. Because we have, we know that we all fail. When somebody fails, we're reminded that we all fail. We don't laugh at them. As some do. So, um, oh boy, you know, leadership comes through example, it comes from the example of a leader. If the leader doesn't show example, um, there's no leadership. So when you have a criminal at the at leading, then people become criminals. When you have saints leading, people become saints. I'm not saying that we're either one. We're somewhere in the middle. <laughs> we try hard. But if we don't try hard and become lax and just become um, uh, Lazy, lackadaisical, that's when things fall apart. So we have to be very careful because it only takes one generation to lose everything. <clears throat> Actually, it takes less, but. Um, 
So the purpose of Sangha is to encourage, for everyone to encourage everyone else. That's the main, the main thing is that for our Sangha is to encourage and be encouraged. And to um, take up the challenge of difficulty. So right now, although I was talking about you know how um, we um, uh, encourage ourselves. Um, When we encourage ourselves, it encourages others. And then that in turn encourage us, uh, encourages ourselves. It'll be wonderful. Right now, I'm sitting in Zendo, which is off limits. Um, but it feels really great. So, at some point, we all hope that we'll all be able to sit in the zendo. There are you know, new people who have only been here for maybe a year or less than a year. Um, they don't know. They don't have the experience, or you don't have the experience, of um, sitting in the zendo with everyone. It's very different than sitting on, uh, in Zoom. But we, we, I appreciate our, our Zoom. I think Zoom is really help, very helpful. And um, there are certain advantages to it. So there's a question of, I may be diverging, but there's a question of um, how will things turn out? What will, when the pandemic hopefully is over, um, well, what, will, what will the changes be? Will everybody think, well, it's more, it's more convenient to just sit on Zoom? For some people, that's probably true. But actually, I think we'll all want to get back to Zendo and practice together in person because uh, it's, the, um, it's three dimensional. <laughs> And the interaction we have of, of, of moving, moving harmoniously together is uh, a, a rare opportunity. I think we'll, most people will come back to the Zendo and sit in the Zendo. And as I can tell you, it just, it, it, when I look at this room, I see it in a way that um, I see it in, in a renewed sense. It's also shiny and clean, and <laughs> the sun is coming through the windows. <laughs> so Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great ball. All the king's horses and all the king's men and women <laughs> couldn't put Humpty back together again. That's true. Humpty had to find himself after the fall. And his perseverance is what makes him, uh, what, what um, energizes him and um, uh, constitutes this practice. And then Sangha supports him, her. Humpty Dumpty is kind of a masculine name, but... <coughs> um, maybe 
find a different variation for women. Our practice, practice leadership at some center is mostly, largely women. His practice is so sincere and wonderful. You know, uh, I don't know, I think I have a little time, but um, there's a koan about the chick and uh, the, the mother hen pecking at the egg and uh, the chick inside the egg pecking. And it's like when the, the mother chick realizes that the baby chick is pe pecking at the, at the egg, at the eggshell, um, that um, they, they do this simultaneously and if they do it just the right moment, the egg cracks and the chick pops out. So, um, uh, this is also like teacher and student, right? Uh, when the, the, the teacher sees the chick at just the right moment, and when the teacher see, seizes the right moment to educate the chick and make, allow the chick to pop out of the shell, uh, that's a wonderful moment. So the teacher has to be very patient. The mother hen has to be very patient sitting on the egg. And the chick has to struggle to um, find their way out of the egg. And the teacher can help, but it's up to the chick to do the work. So that's uh, Humpty Dumpty is has got um, the, his successor, who is himself. <laughs> I I'm, I succeed myself uh, in here, and then uh, it's called uh, the birth of the chick is like rebirth for the student. So Humpty Dumpty is all cracked, you know, has all, all the scars of, um, and cracks and, and um, faults, but uh, manages to hold it all together and come out renewed. So when we talk about uh, enlightenment, um, the, the chick um, is, is um, the renewed hen. The renewal of the hen is the chick. So it's a nice little story. Uh, maybe you have a question. Who's in charge of questions? Um, that would be me. And <clears throat> thank you, Sergeant Roshi. So it looks like we just have a few minutes for questions. And if you'd like to ask a question, you can either enter it in the chat box or raise your virtual hand like Joel just did. And um, we just have a few more, a few minutes for questions. So. Um, Joel, take it away. Sergeant Roshi, thank you for an absolutely wonderful talk. 
Um, I hate to be kind of a downer here, but when you told the story of Humpty Dumpty, I couldn't help but think of the political situation in this country right now. And, mm. and so, you know, in the story, my understanding would be that the egg cracked prematurely and probably the vital life within was not able to survive. So if you can encourage us or um, in the current situation or yes. guide us, yeah. The current situation, I, w I was avoiding. I know you were. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be apolitical, but yeah. um, you know, politics, you cannot avoid politics because politics is interaction. It's all politics. But in this situation, uh, it's a difficult situation. And it gets it alarming. Yes. Like, you know, like, you know, all these accused lies and accusations and the fact, so this is a frustrating, you know, over 20,000 lives and, and growing every day, you know, 25 by now. And the, no, the, there's a whole group of people who just ignore it. That's just one, that's just him, you know. So it makes you think that the world is crazy. <laughs> it is, actually, it's yeah. nuts. Yeah. And that's not only frustrating, it's, it's demoralizing. Yeah. Right? Yes. So how do you deal with, how do you, you know, knowing that this is happening and knowing that you, you have a feeling that the future will, your idea, the future, future's idea, an idea, yeah. will, um, you know, be better at the end of the year. <laughs> no, that's not my idea of the future, unfortunately. Well, well, we, we do, you know, there's hope. That's okay. Hope is good. In well, this, hope is, in this hope case, is great. But hope is good. Yes. But, um, uh, You don't want to say at the end of the year, if only I had done this, right? Right. So you don't want to be able to say that. No. So do this. Do something. Right. Do something. There are, there are things that you can do that help you to ease your mind and say, well, I did contribute something. Yes, that, that helps a lot. Yeah. Yes, that does help a lot. I, did, I didn't just stand by and not do anything. Right. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or just bear, just do something. Just do something, yes. Thank you, Sachin. Okay. Okay, looks like we have time for one more question. And there's a question from Peter E. How should we think about the fragility of the egg? Should we balance the desire to protect it with acceptance that one day it will break? I wouldn't say break, I would say open. Yes, we should protect it. That's, that's, um, um, do you know when, um, I, I think, I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but in the Cloisters, which is a church in uh, New York, there are many tapestries, beautiful tapestries, big tapestries. 
and one of them is a unicorn. And the unicorn is uh, encircled by a fence, and it's a very narrow space. It's got a tree, a unicorn, a tree, and the grass, and the fence, the white fence. And it's like um, when something is growing, you need to protect it. You need to take care of it and protect it and not let it get out and roam around <laughs> and get corrupted. So the egg is like that. The baby is like that. Mothers take, you know, of course, there are different kinds of different <laughs> attitudes with different mothers, but <laughs> but it, basically it's like taking care of this precious thing and not letting it get damaged or corrupted. Because, you know, we are, we are, we do come from eggs. <laughs> so we, we take care of ourselves, take care of the nurture, nurture our um, uh, our egg, so that when we pop out, we have the, all we need to mature. And in a sense, popping out is, is our maturity. So Sojin Roshi, looks like we just have two more questions. That's okay with me. Okay. Uh, Kabir is... Time limits. Okay, good. Kabir is next then. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Sojin. Hi. Thank you for the great talk, as always. <laughs> um, the shame and guilt of uh, mistakes. Uh, very easy to get caught in it. Mm -hmm. um, it even tastes delicious at times, and it's sort of addictive. So that's, that's sort of what I <laughs> have a question on. Yes. Well, um, um, you know, in Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, um, shame and remorse are called the protectors of the Dharma. In other words, you feel that what you did was wrong. That's important. What is also important is that you make repentance and you free yourself from that. If you don't do that, then you just carry it around. And in modern psychology, we're not supposed to feel those things, you know, blah, blah, blah. But actually, they're very important. The key is to repent. In other words, to acknowledge this was wrong. And then, as the Sixth Ancestor says, turn around and go the other direction. Don't dwell on shame and remorse. Acknowledge shame and remorse. That's, your, that's the only way you can free yourself. So free yourself and don't get, and don't get sunk back into um, captivity again. So that's why, um, uh, you know, people, um, uh, it's nice to have a preceptor <laughs> who will help you do that. We, we have a, a ha every, every um, twice a month or once a month, we have um, Bodhisattva ceremony, was, which is a repentance ceremony. It's not so personal, but it, it's, but it is personal. But you don't repent of every little thing you did wrong. But that's, but in, in uh, early Buddhism, that's what the monks did twice a month. And they would uh, acknowledge their transgressions. And then they would receive some kind of, um, uh, I don't want to say punishment, but 
um, something like that. So everybody was encouraged to, all the monks were encouraged to, they would stand up in front of the assembly and talk, and talk about that. So, but um, you can do this by yourself. There's a, um, you have an altar and you have, you know, whatever you put on top of the altar. Uh, and then you um, talk to Buddha <laughs> and um, acknowledge your transgressions. And then you, you continue um, without having to drag it all around. You, you unburden yourself. Um, you know, it's the all my ancient tangled karma, right? From yes, beginning of yes. greed, aid, and illusion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Ed Herzog has a question. Ed, could you unmute yourself? Is that better? Yes, well, yes. that's there. Yes. Um, I'm curious as to why Buddha liked the fourth horse. Because he had a very sympathetic mind. He had a compassionate mind. Mm. His, his compassionate mind was much, his, he had compassion for every living thing. Mm. And not just selective. His compassion was not just selective. He had compassion for um, the result, which was the horse getting whipped, but also he had compassion for his, for the horse's stubbornness as well. Well, you know, getting whipped, that, um, he had compassion for the whipper. <laughs> mm. uh, and, and he had compassion for the horses, but the focus is on the horses. Um, uh, you have to be a little selective when you're talking about something um, uh, in particular. So, um, uh, you know, he had compassion for Hitler. Ooh. Hmm. That's difficult. Yes. He, he, he has compassion for Trump. You know, he's a little boy. He's a little boy that grew up, that grew too big, you know, for, for the size of his brain. And he needs all the love he can get. But Buddha's love is, uh, it's personal and impersonal. So, you know, it, if we want to really bring peace, we can't be so selective. But then we have to know what we mean by love. We have to know what we mean by compassion. So these are hard things to deal with. How do you how do you bring the world to peace and harmony? Not through divisions. No matter how painful it is. No matter how painful it is to um, uh, you know forgiveness doesn't mean that everything's now okay. 
But that's not what it means. Forgiveness means uh, freeing yourself from your feelings. So that you can see things in a rational way. So the worst horse, so to speak, is not the worst horse. And the worst horse is not the best horse. But we have to go deeper in our understanding if, we're, if anything will ever be reconciled. What do we mean by peace? What does that mean? Thank you. Okay. Hey, uh, Susan Moon has a question. Susan, could you please unmute yourself? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. Um, this isn't exactly a question, but it's a comment on Ed's question. And I want to quote you, Sergeant, and my own memory of you teaching about this same uh, story and saying that, that one of the great things about the horse that only runs doesn't run until it, the whip hits the marrow of its bones. Um, and your the story can be about different, different kinds of Zen students and that the student, the one who struggles and tries hard and keeps on practicing, even though they don't, it's much harder for that person to get it. This is a story I've taken comfort from myself. <laughs> you know, if, you're, too. if you're as slow at getting it, um, but you keep on trying, then you, you are, there's something wonderful about that. And the horse that runs mm -hmm. sees the shadow of the whip is, is the horse for whom things come very easily to that horse. And That's right. so maybe it doesn't get as much credit for trying so hard. At least the effort is, is really important. And that, that's maybe one of the reasons that Buddha has such compassion for the fourth horse, that it keeps on trying. Well, of course, that's the, that's the whole yeah, idea. I, and you, you've said that. I, I learned that from you. I'm not <laughs> teaching you. I'm just reminding Ed of that side of it, too. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Also, you know, we really appreciate the new, new people who, are, uh, who, who come to practice and they face all the, all the difficulties of entering the practice. And they're the most encouraging people. I, those are the ones that encourage me the most because they don't um, they're they don't have the experience of seeing what's next <laughs> um, and so they're taking up the challenge of practice uh, without knowing what is really going on uh, and um, that's really encouraging it's like children, you know, uh, when, when you see the, ch the child beginning to walk and, and all this, it, this, it makes the, the parents feel very happy. It looks like we have one final question from okay. Hago. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sojin Roshi. What a beautiful talk, my goodness. Um, a couple of times today you referred to uh, the six ancestors process of uh, repentance and you referred in the first time only to he did an act of what I've translated act of understanding. Uh, he did something physical to make uh, amends or to make a statement of amends. Uh -huh. I wonder if you could talk about what you think might be more important of the acknowledging or the action of understanding or or how would you look at that act uh, to emphasize it a little bit? Well, 
um, basically, I would say, um, you know, well, I just want to say a little something about the, the Platform Sutra. The Platform Sutra is built around a repentance ceremony. The heart of the, of the Platform Sutra is, in, is the repentance ceremony, and, um, which leads to ordination. So you have the repentance ceremony, and, and then you, you free yourself to um, take on the ordination. So that, that whole chapter is about, and, and, and the, whole, the, the whole sutra is built, built around that chapter. Um, so it's a matter of freeing yourself. Repentance means fr finding your freedom. Because as, as long as you're carrying guilt and remorse and all those things uh, uh, with you, it's a burden. So Shakyamuni says, lay down the burden. I've laid down the burden. That, that's, that's the main, uh, his main statement, lay down the burden. So lay down, laying down the burden means freeing yourself. Uh, acknowledging what what was not right and letting go of okay now i can work now i can actually work with this because i've acknowledged it and the the act of turning around and going the other way means that you're doing something about it our, we carry our karma around with us we, Although we can be free from our karma, it, kar karma doesn't go away. The, uh, karma and the fruit of karma. The karma is simply the act, but what we carry around is the result. So, uh, a repentance is... Um, the act of letting go, acknowledging and letting go, and then not turning, not falling back into the same uh, situation. But we do, you know. <laughs> it's hard not to keep falling back into our habits. But it's possible. Like uh, Suzuki Roshi said, you know, he, he, uh, he enumerated all the the, the uh, mystical, magical um, um, uh, acts of the arhat. But he said the one thing that, that, that they're not the only ones that have these. You know, in, like in India, it's very common to have magical uh, pro uh, properties. Um, but um, is, is the most magical property <laughs> uh, is the ability to be free from karma, free from the effect, to, to free yourself from the, the uh, effects of karma by, through repentance. Should we undertake it? Just like the Catholic Church. <laughs> well, so, the Catholics get a, a penance, uh, an penance. action of prayer, but should well, we undertake yes. something specific? Uh, penance. Uh, we should look up the, the etymology of that word, penance. But um, every Every uh, discipline has its own uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. So one of the characteristics that, um, of the Catholic Church is penance. And so I think, like for the sixth ancestor, penance was not necessary. Simply turning around and doing what's right. Thank you. Because penance can be, can be helpful but it can also be a, um, uh, a an impediment because um, 
you're still carrying around um, uh, the burden. And so the idea is that carrying around the burden of uh, penance keeps reminding you, you know. So that it, it can go one way or another. I, I don't want to criticize that. Um, and I, I think there's a little penance <laughs> going on in Buddhism too. But it's not, it, it's not as emphasized. I like to just turn around and go the other way. Yeah.